For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You have heard of the gracious purpose and design of God to recover poor sinners to himself by Jesus Christ, and how his design of love was laid and contrived in the covenant of redemption, whereof we last spoke. So that was a previous sermon of Reverend Flavel, where he spoke of God's eternal covenant of redemption. Now, according to the terms of that covenant, you shall hear from this scripture how that design was by one degree advanced towards its accomplishment in God's actual giving or parting with his own son for us. God so loved the world that he gave. The whole preceding context in John 3 is spent in discovering the nature and necessity of regeneration. The necessity thereof is in this text urged and inferred from the peculiar respect and eye God had upon believers in giving Christ for them, they only reaping all the special and saving benefits and advantages of that gift. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. In the words are to be considered, first, the original spring or fountain of our best mercies, that is, the love of God. The love of God is either benevolent, beneficent, or complacential. His benevolent love is nothing less but his desire and purpose of saving and doing us good. So his purpose and grace in Jacob is called love, Romans 9, verse 13. Jacob have I loved. But his being before Jacob was could consist in nothing else but the gracious purpose of God towards him. So that's his benevolent love. His beneficent love is his actual doing. So not only his purpose, but also his actual doing good to the persons beloved, or his bestowing the effects of his love upon us according to that purpose. His complacent or complacent love is nothing else but that delight and satisfaction he finds in beholding the fruits and workings of that grace in us, which he first intended for us and then actually bestowed on us. The love of benevolence is that which I have opened to you under the former head. In other words, the eternal purpose or plan or covenant of God was his benevolent love. God's compact with Christ about us, or his design to save us, on the articles and terms therein specified. The love of beneficence is that which this scripture speaks of. Out of this fountain, Christ flowed to us, and both ran into that of complacency. For therefore, he both purposed and actually bestowed Christ on us and that he might everlastingly delight in beholding the glory and praise of all his reflected all that is reflected on himself by his redeemed ones this then is the fountain of our mercies secondly the mercy flowing out of this fountain and that is Christ the mercy as he is emphatically called in Luke 1, verse 72, the marrow, kernel, and substance of all other mercies, he gave his only begotten Son. This was the birth of that love. The like whereunto it never brought forth before. Therefore it is expressed with a double emphasis in the text. The one in the particle, so, that he so loved the world. How did he love it? Why, he so loved it, how, but how much the tongues of angels cannot declare. And moreover, to enhance the mercy, he is styled his only begotten son. 
To have given a son had been wonderful, but to give his only begotten son, that is love expressible, unintelligible. Now thirdly, the objects of this love, or the persons to whom the eternal Lord delivered Christ, and that is, the world. This must respect the elect of God in the world, and such as do or shall actually believe, as is exegetically expressed in the next words, that whosoever believes in him should not perish. Those whom he calls the world in that he styles believers in this expression, and the word world is put to signify the elect, because they are scattered through all parts and are among all ranks of men in the world. These are the objects of his love. It is not angels, but men that were so loved. He is called philanthropos. Philanthropy, that's a a way of giving and, and providing for the needs of others. Philanthropos, Latin word. A lover, a friend of men, but never philangelos, a friend or lover of angels or creatures of another species. And fourthly, the manner in which was never enough celebrated mercy flows to us from the fountain of divine love, and that is most freely and spontaneously. He gave, not he sold or barely parted from, but gave. Nor yet does the Father's giving imply Christ to be merely passive, For as the Father is here said to give him, so the Apostle tells us in Galatians 2 verse 20 that he gave himself, who loved me and gave himself for me. The Father gave him out of goodwill to men, and he has willingly bestowed himself on that service. Hence the note is, or here's the main point of the sermon, that the gift of Christ is, is the highest and fullest manifestation of the love of God to sinners that ever was made from eternity to them. That the gift of Christ is the highest and fullest manifestation of the love of God to sinners that ever was made from eternity to them. How is this gift of God to sinners signalized in that place of the Apostle 1 John 4, verse 10, Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us, and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Why does the apostle so magnify this gift in saying, Herein is love, as if there were love in nothing else? May we not say that to have a being a being among the rational creatures, therein therein is love. To have our life carried so many years like a tapper in the hand of providence through so many dangers and not yet put out in obscurity, therein is love. To have food and raiment convenient for us, beds to lie on, relations to comfort us, In all these is love, yea, but if you speak comparatively, in all these there is no love, compared to the love expressed in sending or giving Christ for us. These are great mercies in themselves, like to have the food and to have the clothes and to have a home and have relations. These are great mercies in themselves. But compared to this mercy, that is, that God so loved the world that he gave his Son, to have to, but compared to this mercy, they are all swallowed up. As the light of candles when brought into the sunshine, no, no, herein is love that God gave his Son for us. And it is remarkable that when the Apostle would show us in Romans 5 verse 8, what is the noblest and most uh, fruit that most commends men to the root of divine love that bears it? He shows us this very fruit of it that I am now opening. But God, saith he, 
commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. This is the very flower of that love. The method into which I will cast this precious point shall be this. Here's the three points of the sermon. To show how Jesus Christ was given by the Father. And secondly, how that gift is the fullest and richest manifestation of the love of God that was ever made to the world. And third, then to draw forth the uses of it. So first, to show how Jesus Christ was given by the Father. Secondly, how that gift is the fullest and richest manifestation of the love of God that was ever made to the world. And third, to draw forth some uses. First then, how was Jesus Christ given by the Father and what is implied therein? You are not so to understand it as though God parted with his interest and property in his Son. When he is said to give him, he was as much his own as ever. When men give, they transfer property to another. But when God had given him, he was, I say, still as much his own as ever. But this giving of Christ implies his designation and appointment unto death for us. So he didn't really give him in a way of transferring him, but in a way of designating and appointing him unto death for us. For so you read that it was done according to the determinate counsel of God. Acts 2 verse 23. Look as the lamb under the law was separated from the flock and set apart for a sacrifice. Though it were still living, yet it was intentionally and preparatively given and consecrated to the Lord. So Jesus Christ was, by the counsel and purpose of God, thus chosen and set apart for his sacrifice. And therefore in Isaiah 42 verse 1, God calls him his elect or his chosen one. And again, this giving Christ implies a parting with him or settling him, as the Father has it, at some distance from himself for a time. There was a kind of parting betwixt the Father and the Son when he came to tabernacle in our flesh. So he expresses it in John 16, verse 28, I came forth from the Father and have come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. This distance that this incarnation and humiliation set him at was properly as to his humanity, which was really distant from the glory into which it is now taken up. And in respect of manifestation of delight and love, the Lord seemed to carry it as one at a distance from him. Oh, this was it that so deeply pierced and wounded his soul, as it is evident from that complaint in Psalm 32, verse 1 and 2. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so, thou so far from the words of my roaring? O oh, my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not. God's giving of Christ implies his delivering him into the hands of justice to be punished. Even as condemned persons are, lay sentence of law given or delivered into the hands of executioners. So in Acts 22, verse 23, him being delivered by the determinate counsel of, of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have slain. And so he is said in Romans 8, verse 32, to deliver him up to death for us all. The Lord, when the time was come that Christ must suffer, did, as it were, say, O all ye roaring waves of my incensed justice, now swell as high as heaven and go over his soul and body, sink him to the bottom, let him go like Jonah, his type into the belly of hell, unto the roots of the mountains. Come, all ye raging storms, 
that I have reserved for this day of wrath, beat upon him, beat him down, that he may not be able to look up. As we see it in Psalm 60, verse 2, Go, justice, put him upon the rack, torment him in every part, till all his bones be out of joint, and his heart within him be melted as wax in the midst of his bowels. Psalm 22, verse 14, And ye assembly of the wicked, Jews and Gentiles, that have so long gaped for his blood, now he is delivered into your hands. You are permitted to execute your malice to the full. I now loose your chain, and into your hand and power is he delivered. God's giving of Christ implies his application of him, that in all purchases of his blood, that with all the purchase of his blood, and settling all this upon us as an inheritance and portion. John 6, verse 32 and 33. My Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which came down from heaven and giveth light to the world. God has given him as bread to poor starving creatures that by faith they might eat and live. And so he told the Samaritans in John 4, verse 10, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith unto thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Bread and water are the two necessities for the support of natural life. God has given Christ, you see, to be all that and more to the spiritual life. Now, secondly, how this gift of Christ was the highest and fullest manifestation of the love of God that ever the world saw. And this will be evidenced by the following. If you consider how near and dear Jesus Christ was to the Father, he was his son, his only son, says the text, the son of his love and darling of his soul, his other self, yea, one with himself, the express image of his person, the brightness of the Father's glory. In parting with him, he parted with his own heart, with his own bowels, as I may say. Yet to us a son is given, Isaiah 9, verse 6, and such a son as he calls his dear son, Colossians 1, verse 13. A late writer tells us that he has been informed that in the famine in Germany, a poor family being needy, to per- being ready to perish with famine, the husband made a motion to his wife, to sell one of the children for bread, to relieve themselves and the rest. So in a famine in Germany, the husband proposed that they sell one of the children as a slave so that the rest of the family could live. The wife at last consents it should be so, but then they began to think which of the four should be sold And when the eldest was named, they both refused to part with that, being their firstborn and the beginning of their strength. Well, then they came to the second, but could not yield that he should be sold, being the very picture and lively image of his father. And the third was named, but that was a child that best resembled the mother. And when the youngest was thought on, That was the Benjamin, the child of their old age. And so were content rather to perish altogether in the famine than to part with a child for relief. And you know how tenderly Jacob took it when his Joseph and Benjamin were rent from him. What is a child but a piece of the parent wrapped up in another skin? And yet our dearest children are but as strangers to us 
in comparison of the unspeakable dearness that was betwixt the Father and Christ, now that he should ever be content to part with a son, and such an only one, is such a manifestation of love as will be admired to all eternity. And then let it be considered to what he gave him. He gave him even to death, and that of the cross, to be made a curse for us, to be the scorn and contempt of men, to the most unparalleled suffering that ever were inflicted or borne by any. It melts our bowels, it breaks our heart, to behold our children striving in the pains of death. But the Lord beheld his son struggling under agonies that never any fell before him. He saw him falling to the ground, groveling in the dust, sweating blood, and amidst these agonies turning himself to his father, and with a heart-rending cry beseeching him, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass. Luke 22, verse 42. To wrath, to the wrath of an infinite God without mixture, to the very torments of hell was Christ delivered, and that by the hand of his own father, Sure then, that love must needs want a name. Or what name would you give such a love which made the Father of mercies deliver his only Son to such miseries for us? It is a special consideration to enhance the love of God in giving Christ that in giving him he gave the richest jewel in his cabinet a mercy of the greatest worth and most inestimable value. Heaven itself is not so valuable and precious as Christ himself is. He is the better half of heaven. And so the saints account him in Psalm 73, verse 25, Whom have I in heaven but thee? Ten thousand thousands worlds, says one, as many worlds as angels can number, and then as a new world of angels can multiply, would not all be the bulk of a balance to weigh Christ's excellency, love and sweetness. Oh, what a fair one, what an only one, what an excellent, lovely, ravishing one is Christ. But the beauty of 10,000 paradises like the Garden of Eden, into one. Put all trees, all flowers, all smells, all colors, all tastes, all joys, all sweetness, all loveliness in one. Oh, what a fair and excellent thing would that be. And yet it should be less to that, and yet it should be less to that fair and dearest, well-beloved Christ than one drop of rain to the whole seas, rivers, lakes, and fountains of ten thousand earths. Christ is heaven's wonder and earth's wonder. Now for God to bestow the mercy of mercies, the most precious thing in heaven or earth upon poor sinners, and as great, as lovely, as excellent as his Son was, yet not to account him too good to bestow upon us, What manner of love is this? Once more, let it be considered on whom the Lord bestows his Son. Upon angels? No, but upon men. Upon man, his friend? No, but upon his enemies. This is love. And on this consideration, the apostle lays a mighty weight in Romans 5, verse 8 through 10. But God, saith he, commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. When we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son. Who would part with a son for the sake of his dearest friends? But God gave him to and delivered him for enemies. O love unspeakable! And lastly, let us consider how freely this gift came from him. 
It was not wrested out of his hand by our importunity, for we as little desired as deserved it. It was surprising, preventing, that's the old-fashioned word of preventing, in other words, going before, going ahead. He was first with it. It was surprising, preventing eternal love that delivered him to us. Not that we loved him, but he first loved us. 1 John 4, verse 19. Thus, as when you weigh a thing, you cast in weight after weight till the scales break, so does God, one consideration upon another to overcome our hearts and make us admiringly to cry, what manner of love is this? And thus I have showed you what God's giving of Christ is and what matchless love is manifested in that incomparable gift. And next we shall apply this in some particular corollaries. Reverend Flavel, he calls these points corollaries. Corollary is a proposition that flows from the proofs that were given. So the sermon so far were proofs of the eternal love of the Father and of the Son in giving them himself. So now he will make some, he will give some deductions or some things that we can learn from the proofs that he has given. Corollaries, he calls them, or uses. Application, we would say, probably. First of all, learn hence the exceeding preciousness of souls, and at what a high rate God values them, that he will give his son, his only son, out of his bosom, as a ransom for them. Surely this speaks of their preciousness. God would not have parted with such a son for small matters. All the world could not redeem them. Gold and silver could not be their ransom. So speaks the Apostle in 1 Peter 1, verse 18, You were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Such an esteem God had for them, that is, souls, that rather than that they should perish, Jesus Christ shall be made a man, yea, a curse for them. Oh, then learn to put a due value upon your own souls. Do not sell that cheap, which God hath paid so dear for. Remember what a treasure you carry about you. The glory that you see in this world is not equivalent in worth to it. Matthew 16, verse 26. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? And second use If God has given his own son for the world, then it follows that those for whom God gave his own son may warrantably expect any other temporal mercy from him. This is the apostle's inference in Romans 8, verse 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? And so in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 21 and 22, all is yours, for ye are Christ. That is, they hold all other things in Christ, who is the capital and most comprehensive mercy. To make out the grounds of this comfortable deduction, let these four things be pondered and duly weighed in your thoughts. First of all, no other mercy you need or desire is or can be so dear to God as Jesus Christ is. He never laid any other thing in his bosom as he did his son. As for the world and the comforts of it, it is the dust of his feet. He values it not, as you see by his providential disposals of it, having given it to the worst of men. All the Turkish Empire, says Martin Luther, as great and glorious as it is, is but a crumb which the master of the family throws to the dogs. 
Think upon any other outward enjoyment that is valuable in your eyes. And there is not so much comparison betwixt it and Christ in the esteem of God as is betwixt your dear children and the lumber of your houses. In your esteem, if then God has parted so freely from that which was infinitely dearer to him than these, how shall he deny these when they may promote his glory and your good? So secondly, under this, you think of as Jesus Christ was nearer to the heart of God than all these things. That means all the other things in this world or that you need. So Christ is in himself much greater and more excellent than all of them. 10,000 worlds and the glory of them all is but the dust of the balance if weighed with Christ. These things are but poor creatures, but he is over all, God blessed forever. Romans 9 verse 5, they are common gifts, but he is the gift of God. John 4 verse 10, they are ordinary mercies, but he is the mercy. In Zechariah's song in Luke 1 verse 72, as one pearl or precious stone is greater in value than 10,000 common pebbles. Now, if God has so freely given the greater, how can you suppose he should deny the lesser mercies? Will a man give to another a large inheritance and stand with him for a trifle? It will not be. There is no, thirdly, there is no other mercy you want, but you are entitled to it by the gift of Christ. It is, as to right, conveyed to you with Christ. So in the foresighted, 1 Corinthians 3, verse 21 through 23, the world is yours, yea, all is yours, for ye are Christ. And so you can read in 2 Corinthians 1, verse 20, for all the promises of God in Christ, in him they are yea, and in him amen, with him He has given you all things, 1 Timothy 6, verse 17, richly to enjoy. The word signifies to have the sweet relish and comfort of an enjoyment. So have we in all our mercies upon the account of our title to them in Christ. And fourthly, under this use, if God has given you this nearer, greater, and all-comprehending mercy, when you were enemies to him and alienated from him, it is not imaginable he should deny you any inferior mercy when you are come into a state of reconciliation and amity with him. So the apostle reasons in Romans 5, verse 8 through 10, for if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And thus you have the second inference with its grounds. Now the third use for application. If the greatest love has been manifested in giving Christ to the world, then it follows that the greatest evil and wickedness is manifested in despising, slighting, and rejecting Christ. It is said to abuse the love of God manifested in the lowest gift of providence, but to slight the richest discoveries of it, even in that peerless gift wherein God commends his love in the most taking and astonishing manner. This is sin with a witness. Blush, O heavens, and be astonished O earth, yea, be horribly afraid. No guilt like this. The most brutal and cruel wretches among the barbarous nations are innocent in comparison of this. But are there any such in the world? Dare any slight this gift of God? Indeed, if men's words might be taken, there are few or none that dare do so. 
But if their lives and practices may be believed, this, this is the sin of the far greater part of the Christianized world. Witness the lamentable stupidity and inactivity. Witness the contempt of the gospel. Witness the hatred and persecution of this, of his image, laws, and people. What is the language of this, all, all this, but a vile esteem of Jesus Christ? And now let me a little apostulate with those ungrateful souls that trample underfoot the Son of God, that value not this love and gave, that gave him forth. What is that mercy which you so condemn and undervalue? Is it so vile and cheap a thing as your entertainment speaks it to be? Is it indeed worth no more than this in your eyes? Surely you will not be long of that opinion. Will you be of that mind, think on, when death and judgment shall have thoroughly awakened you? Oh no, then a thousand worlds for a Christ. As it is storied of our crooked back Richard, Richard was evidently a king or some kind of captain in the army in England, when he lost the field and was in great danger by his enemies that pressed upon him. Oh, now, said he, a kingdom for a horse. In other words, I would trade my kingdom if I could have a horse to get out of here. Oh, or think we that any beside you in this world are of your mind? You are deceived if you think so. To them that believe he is precious through all the world, 1 Peter 2, verse 7. And in the other world, they are of a quite contrary mind. Could you but hear what is said of him in heaven? In what a dialect the saved of the Lord do extol their Savior? Or could you but imagine the self-revenges and the self-torments which the damned suffer for their folly? And what a value they would set upon one tender of Christ. If it might be again, if it might be but again be hoped for, you would see that such as you are the only despisers of Christ. Beside, I think it is astonishing that you should despise a mercy in your own souls are so dearly, so deeply, so everlastingly concerned as they are in this gift of God. If it were but the soul of another, nay, less, if but the body of another, and yet less than that, if but another's beast, whose life you could preserve, you are obliged to do it. But when it is you, yea, the best part of you, your own invaluable soul, that you ruin and destroy thereby. Oh, what a monster you are! To cast it away thus, what? Will you slight your own souls? Care you not whether they be saved or whether they be damned? Is it indeed an indifferent thing with you which way they fall at death? Have you imagined a tolerable hell? something you could live with? Is it easy to perish? Are you not only turned God's enemies, but your own too? Oh, see what monsters sin can turn men and women into. Oh, the stupefying, besetting, intoxicating power of sin. But perhaps you think that all these are but uncertain sounds with which we alarm you. It may be your own heart will preach such doctrine as this to you. Who can assure you of this, of the reality of these things? Why should you trouble yourself with an invisible world or be so much concerned for what your eyes never see, saw, nor did ever receive the report from any that had, have seen them? Well, though we cannot now show you these things, 
yet surely they shall be shown you, and your own eyes shall behold them. You are convinced and satisfied that many other things are real, which you never saw. But be assured that if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at first was began to be spoken to us by the Lord and was confirmed to us by them which heard it? God also bearing them witness, Hebrews 2, verse 2 through 4. But if they be certain, yet they are not near, it will be a long time before they come. Poor soul, how do you cheat yourself? It may be not by twenty parts so long a time as your own fancy draws it forth for you. You are not certain of the next moment. And suppose what you imagine. What are twenty or forty years when they are past? Yea, what are a thousand years to vast eternity? Go trifle away a few days more, sleep out a few nights more, and then lie down in the dust. It will not be long ere the trump of God shall awaken you, and your eyes shall behold Jesus coming on the clouds of heaven. And then you will know the price of his, of this sin. Oh, therefore, if there be any sense of eternity upon you, any pity or love of yourselves in you, if you have any concernments more than the beasts that perish, despise not your own offered mercies. Slight not the richest gift that ever was yet open to the world and a sweeter cannot be open to all eternity. Amen.